Thank you for having me. You're welcome. And um, that's actually a big pleasure to have a conversation with you here. And the idea of me talking is more to give you guys inspiration and give you back the mic so you can ask questions. So let's just get Sorry, the ball. Just, just no. before you continue with that, you said 306 million for 6%. 60. 60%, yeah. Okay. It's just my well, I, I, I wish it was 6%, but it's there. Yeah, I, I wish too. <laughs> and I, we all will be here asking for some angry investment. Well, we are here for that. <laughs> just that we'll be asking more investment. So, thank you for being here. And um, so, guys, if you have any questions, just raise your hand, and I want it to be a conversation between all of us. So, we all know that uh, we might all have read what's on your description, but I also like to start with that question. Who are you? <laughs> Who am I? Uh, in terms of personality? Whatever you want. Whatever I want. Um, <clears throat> Who am I? Uh, that's a good question to start off with. Uh, so, a bit of background, born in Sramban, uh, moved up to PJ or KL uh, quite a while back, so I guess I would be considered a KL slash PJ boy. Um, I kind of, I guess growing up at the time, I, uh, I always thought I would be an entrepreneur because at the age of eight, um, I took my uncle's grass cutter, went around the neighborhood, um, actually undercut the current grass cutter's price so that I could actually get some pocket money. The kind of person that the market loves. Yes. <laughs> um, so, very fairly early, uh, fairly early on, I always thought that I would always be in business. But uh, I guess growing up in a um, sort of poor and then sort of middle income family, uh, all those sort of aspirations were kind of Say so, you know you have to go and work and you got to get go study hard uh, get a good job and uh, be someone later on. Uh, so those aspirations of you know trying to be an entrepreneur at a young age uh, all sort of got put back. Uh, I guess put back about twenty years, oh. yeah, fifteen years actually. Yeah. Um, so while while growing up, so you uh, didn't have enough money to uh, get an education. So uh, I only have a diploma in uh, architecture. Uh, but architecture. architecture, yes. Really? Yes. Oh. Only a diploma because uh, couldn't couldn't continue. And uh, uh, an uncle of mine was at the time working for Ogilvy and Mather in Malaysia, and he said, uh, "What you know? What? Why don't you just come by and uh, intern for six months and see whether you like it?" So okay, I said, "Well, well went for six months. Uh, got bumped around to the various department, and I said, "Cool, man. This place is so freaking cool because." You know, the, the people, at that time when I was, you know, Man Man, right? The, 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 the TV series? That is exactly how I grew up. I kid you not, I kid you not. There's a lot of smoking, a lot of drinking, a lot of sex. So I looked at it and said, wow, man, this, is, this can't be bad. Sounds exciting. Yeah, very exciting. <laughs> this can't be bad. So um, I said, yeah, I'll, I'll give this a shot. And uh, so I got accepted at McCann's uh, uh, in the media department. <laughs> Worked there for a while, and uh, then I sort of spent about 16 years in advertising. And those were some freaking 16 awesome years. <laughs> <laughs> yes, awesome years. Because of the advertisement, because of management. <laughs> because of the after-work curriculum. <laughs> curriculum activities. <laughs> I mean, you're in advertising, you can get away with anything. Uh, you know, you could be smoking pot in the office, you get caught by the boss and he says, no, where's my joint? <laughs> um, <laughs> a very large uh, conglomerate. <laughs> um, but, uh, so that, that sort of, that's my sort of background in uh, advertising. Uh, I, I loved what I did. I, uh, got, again, the, the bio that you read of me in uh, one of the travel conferences. Uh, so for bad behavior in Malaysia, they sent me to Indonesia, um, the way I, where I spent four years there. And it was actually the right four years because it was between um, 90, 92 to 96. Uh, that time Indonesia was taking off and uh, 
I, I keep telling people, if you put a monkey in my position, the monkey will still do as well as I do. Because you, know, you cannot go, go wrong during that time. So I had fantastic four years there. You know, first time being an expat, young, single, head of office. Um, you know, uh, the nightlife was fantastic. <laughs> it's, I think it's, it's still fantastic. Man. Just that I don't have the energy now. Um, <laughs> And then, uh, again, for really bad behavior, they sent me off to, to Beijing, uh, where, where I spent another four years. And um, I guess I can segue into how I met my partner. Sure. Shall I? Sure. Yeah, so when I arrived in Beijing, it was 1996. Um, again, the, I guess one main reason why I wanted to also move to China was uh, I'm Chinese, but I do not speak a word of Chinese. I grew up just speaking English at home, not even Cantis, uh, Hokkien, or any of the dialects that I'm supposed to be speaking. So I think, figured that's a good chance, chance to um, head off to a country where I'm so sort of originally from, uh, try and learn the language, and obviously have a good time as well. So when in '96, uh, and it was also again, you put a monkey in my position at the time, the monkey also would do well. So because '96 to 2000 was just. You know, I'm just taking off. You give yourself lots of credit. Yes, I give a lot of credit to the monkey. <laughs> Pretty smart monkey. Um, and uh, while I was there, I think it was... Uh, yeah, while I was there, I sort of met my, my American partner, Fritz Demopoulos, which some of you may or may not know. Uh, he also arrived about the same time as I did, about a month uh, diff, uh, apart. Uh, and had, at that time, he was working for News Corp and he was trying to sell space on China Byte, which was the leading IT website in China at the time. And so he came over to office, my office, because I, we were represent, representing IBM. Uh, we started chatting a bit and uh, we said, oh, this new thing about internet is kind of cool, right? Yes, yes, it's new. No, no. Uh, then we sort of over beers because both of us were foreigners. Uh, so I said, yeah, it might be a good thing to sort of try to, you know, start an internet company. Neither of us have ever started a company before, but we said it might be a good time because no one else knew know about it, so why don't we start? Um, so we looked at what, what are the things that we need to start at, uh, what, uh, and obviously, and some of you have heard this before, one of the things that we didn't want to do was to do anything illegal that required a license because we didn't want to go to Chinese jail. Um, and so we looked at what were the um, websites that were available at that time. And a lot of that were uh, what you call portals, which is obviously uh, yeah, no longer... No? The Yahoo kind of thing. Yes, yeah, the, the people don't know portals these days, right? It's, yeah. it's a very old term. It was basically the... Uh, but it's funny because the portals played such an important role that in Patrick Grove's interview, yep. when they started, they also wanted to be a portal. And right. then they found something else. But I think Patrick's also on my John, uh, my era, right? Sorry? Patrick is from my era, right? Not the younger era, is it? He is slightly different colors. Okay. Similar era. Okay. For your, yeah, we'll tell the story. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so where was I before I was interrupted? Um, <laughs> portal. Portal. portal, yes, portal, yeah. Okay, I, I give my age away as well because my memory is fading. So better do this interview no, very quickly. Just, just kidding. <laughs> uh, so yeah, everyone was doing portal and we said, yeah, we, we won't want to get into it because um, they all went on to become very big portals. Now people like William with NetEase, uh, Charles with uh, Sohu and uh, well, the other guys from uh, Sina. Um, so we said, yeah, let's let's try and do something that's different, something that we don't require us to, to get licenses for. Looked at it and we came, I, I don't know how we arrived at sports, but we arrived at sports. So we said, okay, this is non-political, we can actually do re sports reporting. Um, so let's look at the US and what's available in the US offices. So we said ESPN, let's, let's follow ESPN. So we, uh, we didn't follow the style of ESPN, ESPN but we said let's, let's cover the very Chinese um, sports like table tennis, no sorry, ping pong, uh, volleyball, uh, gymnastics, basketball, uh, football and, and such. Uh, so we actually sort of, uh, started a 
sports website called Shawe, uh, which in English means Brave Shark. Uh, and we started sort of going around hiring journalists uh, to help us with the content. Um, and I think one of the things that we we did, which I think was fairly creative, was at that time um, Reuters had their news feed only in English. Uh, and we went to them and said, Look, can we get news feed, international news feed? And they said, sure, it's 10,000 US dollars a month. And we said, uh, yeah, we only have you know, $40,000 in the bank, so we're not going to be able to afford that $10,000 per month. But that 10000 came with um, news feed plus uh, pictures. So we went back and said, look, there must be a way where we can actually try and get this news content for free. Um, but all, all of it was English. So we said, look, we went back to Reuters and said, oh, we'll do a deal. You give us the news feed in English, we'll get our journalists to translate it into Chinese. We'll give it back to you for you to sell out to whoever else you want to sell on. But give us a six hour lead time, lead, where we actually publish the news on our website first before they start selling it up. So the Reuters guy said, hmm, okay, nah, nah, nah. They said, yeah, okay, fine, it's, it's got, it cost them nothing. They, there's no revenue stream for them at the time because uh, a lot of the websites were in English. Uh, we're, we're Chinese, so it's a win-win situation. So we said, yeah, we'll do that. Um, so we just started translating. We got the news uh, ahead of time. We, so we were the first website that uh, published all the small sports uh, news uh, before everyone else. Uh, and both of us won because you know, they didn't have to pay. They actually made money uh, selling the translations off again. Um, so what, one of the le lessons that I've learned in, in China is that if you can try and big borrow or steal, big borrow and steal. Because if you're doing a startup and you only have two dollars, you better make sure that two dollars lasts for you know, 20 days rather than uh, two days. Um, so be, be creative with, with how you're gonna uh, go about getting your resources. Um, one of the other things that we, and again, this, this is talking about the heydays of internet, uh, not like these days where there's so much money running around. Um, you know those things about people saying writing valuations on napkins. It is true. We actually have a few napkins that have valuations on it. But more importantly, um, we when we were going on, uh, we didn't have obviously find, uh, money to buy hardware. So we went up to Sun and HP and said, "No, look, can you loan us two servers each that we can actually sort of you know test this thing out and." Um, that time it was just there's so much frenzy with the internet that they actually gave us two. Uh, so we had four servers, two Sun servers and two HP servers. Uh, the HP they said they will actually load it to us, but uh, I think when we sold the company, we sold the servers and the company as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so yeah, th th those times were I guess uh, probably not rep replicable now, but. Uh, I guess if you're doing startups, you know, wherever you can find an opportunity to um, take an advantage of someone or some company, do it. Never do it. Never do it. In a good way. Yeah, in a good way. In a win-win situation. Yes. Yeah. But, um, so, going back a bit, <coughs> so you met your partner and you became friends basically because you go further, supposed to be Chinese, and you start hanging out. And from there, you just look for the gap or the big opportunity that was online. The easiest thing that you could not go in jail and you start a new sport of for sports. <laughs> and but what experience in life did you have that you think that taught you to be so opportunistic in a good way? What do you think? Did, how do you recall learning on how to seize, identify, and seize opportunities? Um, I think that sort of. <laughs> I don't know, probably ingrained in me where, you know, when, when I was young, obviously I, like I said, um, started grass cutting from the neighborhood, um, did a few odd jobs here and there. Uh, I guess it's, it's something that you either probably have it or you don't. Uh, again, you know, when we talked about this earlier on, I think I come from the older school of businessmen where if, if you look at the old businessmen uh, of I don't know, the 60s, 70s, when you actually go up to them with a, a proposition, uh, they, don't do have, they don't have to do a lot of market research, they don't have to validate you know, the, the business model, they kind of look and think and then they say, in my gut feel, 
I know this will work. So <clears throat> I guess for me, it's a lot more of a gut feel to sort of say, you know, look at certain things and say, I think that's an opportunity mm -hmm. in, uh, in this yes, area. How did the news portal work? How did Xiaowei, right? Yes, Xiaowei. Yeah. How did it work? <laughs> um, the, uh, so that was our first exit where uh, we started in 1998. Uh, we exited in 2000. Um, unfortunately, we exited in a very tumultuous period where, as you know, 2000 was when the Nasdaq crashed. Um, we were in negotiations, negotiations with uh, Lee Kashing, uh, Tom Online, um, <clears throat> and we could actually see the you know, Nasdaq keep coming down, and we were d still doing due diligence, and uh, there were some hiccups along the way. But to cut the story short, so we we closed at a far lower value than what we had agreed upon. Uh, by that time, we, the, the market was crashing, so we said, yeah, let's you know, take the money and run. And, uh, it's, a, it's a lot more money than we both had uh, initially thought that we would actually get from the business. And we thought that it was actually play money, funny money. You had no option, basically? No. It's funny because you actually did the same generation of Patrick Grove, and I'm really like, they had an even more shameful story. Yeah. yeah. But that's that's so that, that like happens to many people. That the the crash. Then you uh, you exited your first company. <coughs> and back to a little bit to the story of it. When you started your first company, did you go for investors? Did you start with your own money? How hmm. did you do it? Yeah. So uh, so Fritz and I, uh, well, I guess having been working at corporate life, we've obviously have a bit of savings. So we cobbled together, I think about 30,000 US dollars together and started the company. And at that time, um, that 30,000 could actually last us quite a long uh, way because uh, coders were actually very cheap or they would actually come and work for free with stock options uh, promises. Um, we basically got the office space for practically free. Um, so that 30,000 actually lasted us quite a fair bit. Uh, when we raised our first round, I think we raised it about 15 months into operate. No, I take that back. 12 months into operation, and uh, we managed to get some small companies to invest in us: um, SoftBank, Intel, and IDG. Yeah. So, yeah. So, 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 uh, um, and again, it's it, how did they do it? Huh? How? Why? Why? Why did why did they do it? Yeah. Because it was just a frenzy at the time. So you know they were uh, Intel wanted to come in because they thought that uh, whatever internet companies were doing would actually help their processor sales. So they basically and any company that went to them, they said, "Yeah, I'll cut you a check." And, you know, that's it. Uh, SoftBank again was obviously very uh, active in that era where they were just cutting checks uh, left, right, and center. So we were fortunate to be in that position. We managed to raise a million each from uh, three of them, um, and uh, they, they, they were also very good investors because Intel obviously uh, provided us with technical support. Uh, SoftBank gave us uh, the network. IDG at the time was obviously very big in uh, investing into co uh, commercial uh, consumer-based internet, so they also had a lot of network uh, possibilities for us. Uh, unfortunately, we did not collaborate with any of the investee companies that they had because in, in the second year we basically sold the company. So, how did you operate before selling the company? It's about two and a half years. Two and a half years, and then um, when you brought, did you think of selling from the beginning, or did you start? What was the plan when you started that company? The, the, uh, Fritz and I are very practical people. We are not here to uh, build to last kind of people, so we, we don't. Uh, I guess that that's the difference between uh, people like Jack Ma, uh, Charles Jung, and people like Fritz and Douglas Koo, where they are, when they say, when they say they are something, they, um, they, they, they are stuck with a B. You know, I'll start with M. Yeah, so they're all billionaires and we're all really millionaires. Uh, but we were uh, very, pragmatic about it, we said, look, uh, it's going to be a flip. Uh, our horizon is between three to five years. And if we actually get in and flip it at the right price, we'll flip it. And how many companies were trying to do the same thing as you were in China by that time? Um, so because of the 
NASDAQ crash, um, I think a lot of companies either sort of closed, shut down, mm -hmm. ran out of money, or sort of the larger ones like Nelly, Sohu, and uh, Sina managed to continue because they obviously have a bigger uh, uh, investor. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for the next 2000, probably the next 2000, 2003, there weren't a lot of trades made uh, because there simply wasn't any companies to be bought or. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the big ones that were uh, chugging along were obviously still continue to uh, um, raise capital. Nice. And if you can, like, um, we're going to keep on going in the timeline and then what happened in the future after you sold this company. But if you can define one factor that contributed for you guys to be successful and maybe for you to be successful through all your journey before that, because you sound so confident about all the things you could be doing and like a monkey could also be doing that but it was still you. So what do you think how do you what do you delegate like the success to? Yeah. <clears throat> um, so there <laughs> there are a lot of failures as well. So it's not just the success, there's a lot of failures. We we had a one company that uh, failed miserably, and I had one company in, in Hong Kong that failed miserably as well. So, um, I guess the success in China is, again, um, I, given the period that we were at, uh, at least for the first one, it was basically, that was just being lucky, being in the right place at the right time. Um, with uh, China, uh, I guess with the experience that we garnered from the first venture, uh, and a couple of failed ventures in between, uh, we sort of you know learned a few things and said let's let's try not to replicate that. Um, we were also fortunate that we had very good team members. Where the from the first venture that we had, the uh, senior uh, VPs that we had have come along with us along the way, and they are some of them are still working at China now. Um, some of them have left after making a lot of money. Um, but yeah, it, it, it helps when you actually have uh, good staff with you. But I think more importantly, I think it's, it's about the timing. Uh, to be able to, I guess, see the opportunity and say, is this opportunity right for this timing that you we're in? If it's not, then we may have to sort of either scale back or you know, push back the timing, uh, the project a bit better. So I, I think one of the things that we were fortunate with was uh, looking at the timing that we had. Awesome. So we talked before. Uh, we talked a little bit about this experience he had with timing, and the team, the story of the team is also really interesting. How he's saying his team was the same to how many companies that he started, hmm. including one the second failed, and they kept yeah, wanting to work with them. So this is very interesting. But uh, just to tell you, I also think we should talk a lot about having Douglas who's very able to seize opportunities, talking about <coughs> opportunities that he sees currently in this market. But just having an overview of all the things that we could talk to him about and hoping that we have time for it. But tell them, uh, your second company actually failed and it has to do with timing. So can you just tell us a little bit what was it about and what was your main learning okay. yeah. about that one? Yeah. I guess after the first one, we, we thought that we were masters of the universe and nothing, nothing we did could fail. Um, so we said, look, uh, looking at the demographics in China at the time was 99% male and 1% female. And said, so we said, this demographics has to change. So there, w there should be a lot more women coming online. Um, so we said, hey, it might be a good, good uh, thing to um, start up a women's website. So we looked at uh, the US and uh, we said, let's try and emulate iVillage. <coughs> I, I don't know whether they're still around, but yeah, uh, iVillage in the US. Um, and we went around to uh, try and hire a staff up for this uh, venture. We managed to get the chief representative of Hachette, uh, which publishes Marie Claire magazine in China. She came on board as the CEO. She brought along her part of her uh, team, Jeremy's team. And we started, so we said, yeah, definitely uh, there's a market for it because there's, you know, the women uh, demographic will grow. Uh, Twelve months later, uh, there were, I think, seven other competitors, and there was still only 1% of women online. Uh, so we couldn't get revenues, we couldn't get 
users <laughs> to view the site. Um, so we decided that maybe we were a bit ahead of our time. Uh, and we said, let's, let's call it quits because uh, it's, it's not going to happen. I think we, if we had started it about five years later, I think we might have uh, succeeded. Um, but then again, the, the other thing about China is that once you actually launch a, a new category or a new idea, a new concept, new business model, immediately you will probably have six, seven, eight, nine, ten competitors doing the same thing as you, you have. Uh, it happened, uh, didn't happen so much with China, uh, with Huawei, but um, with China, within the first month we had, I think, nine other competitors doing the same thing as us, two of which just totally ripped our site. Um, look and feel and layout and content exactly the same. Who did you copy? Uh, we we, we uh, emulated uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I am. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. It, yeah, this is China, right? So in China, there's no new ideas. There still isn't any new ideas. Um, so we we looked at kayak and we said, yeah, let's let's do kayak in China and. But at least we didn't sort of rip off the look, feel, and uh, content from them. We, we started from scratch, uh, and, and that was kind of fun. That's fun. And then, uh, currently, what other companies are main competitors of China in China? If you talk about uh, vertical meta search engine, then uh, there are a couple of smaller ones. Uh, we're now by far the largest. Elong. Elong. Elong, Elong is uh, an OTA. Uh, online travel agents, so we work with Elong to provide the data. Uh, so the, the difference is that uh, we are meta search engine, so if you look at this as a Google for travel, uh, and then Elong is like a, a Expedia uh, TripAdvisor, uh, not Expedia Travelocity type. So uh, when, we, when we started in China, uh, Elong and, and Ctrip uh, looked at us and said, oh, you're competing with us. Um, and there were a lot of legal lawsuits, uh, the legal letters being thrown around. But we said, look, we're not, we're a, a matter search engine. And again, uh, it's a concept that it's very new in China, so we had to do a lot of education. Um, and then slowly they began to, uh, after the denial phase, they said, okay, then, uh, well, you can't be doing this because we're not going to give you data because you're going to take users away from our site to other sites. Uh, then from then we start trying to convince them. They say, look, you know, our users, quality users, uh, they need to know what's the best uh, fare available, and it's a fair open market, so you shouldn't be afraid of competing in that sense. Uh, and now they're one of our biggest partners in China. Um, so what was I saying just now? Um, Should I ask another question? Yes, I, 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 I tend to float off somewhere. What are the current competitors like right. dominant, dominant? But basically say that China is actually the, do, the dominant one. In fact, when I told the Chinese star wine directors, they were like, <gasps> they want to have a speaker now. Yeah. So maybe they might fight to China. So just, just, just to clarify, it's not Kuna, okay? It's not Kuna, it's China. China. <laughs> Yeah, I tried learning Mandarin. Yeah. We can talk to Patricia here. Okay. Patricia, she's gonna try your Mandarin later. Oh. Chengdu. I, I need I need a, another Heineken before my Mandarin gets bad. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. So, going back to the to the story of how you found your team, tell us just a little bit. This is very interesting. How they kept with you and about the holiday break you had in between the women's company hmm. and China. Hmm. So tell me, what's the magic behind that level of engagement that you achieved with your team? So tell us the story and the magic behind it. Do you know cult leaders? Huh? Cult leaders. What? Cult leaders. Cult leaders, leaders of cult. Oh, yeah. cult leaders. Cult leaders, yeah. Oh, we have one here. <laughs> yeah. No, um, uh, in, the, in the first company that we saw, uh, unfortunately uh, for the staff, uh, the founders took most of the uh, proceeds. Um, we, we, so we, we had enough for the employees in their stock options where they, they managed to actually make some money. And at that time, it was still decent money. It wasn't fantastic, they couldn't at all retire and become angel investors. Um, and, and they sort of had fun while we were doing, uh, because again, you know, the two of us, not knowing China, not knowing language, 
uh, fumbling around with the first startup in China. Uh, we were fairly loose in, in, with the office and, and how we wanted to go about running the, the company. But we made it very uh, uh, strict where we would actually follow, follow international uh, practices. So we, we don't do brown envelopes, we don't um, you know, do all the other sorts of stuff that we would do karaoke and uh, uh, baijiu, but we won't do uh, brown envelopes. Because um, we actually made sure that the staff would say, you know, these are foreigners that want to actually bring in um, best practices from overseas. So we all had fun during the first two years. Um, and when we actually did the second one, which failed, uh, they said, okay, never mind. So we, we all sort of learned from there. Uh, we then sort of broke off everyone, uh, sort of the, most of the VPs went off to work for other internet startups, uh, Fritz and I. So bumped around, played golf a lot, uh, traveled a fair bit, uh, did a bit of consulting work here and there. Um, and during that sort of hiatus period, we will, we will always go back to Beijing and have dinner with the staff and they will say, so when's the next venture? <laughs> then I will say, no, 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 not yet, not yet. Uh, so how often do you have dinners with them? It's like once a quarter. Yeah, and we all, I guess we, we wanted to keep in touch with them because they were, they were, also, they were actually very um, valuable employees as well. Uh, so we we'll actually do that and uh, then after a while obviously our hands got a bit itchy and said yeah, maybe it's time to, we can't be playing golf every day, we can't be you know, traveling every day so let's uh, do another venture and we said yeah let's, let's do that and we again looked through at the opportunities that were available in China and uh, sort of try and decide what to do. And what would, what would you say that you are things you did to keep the partnership relation with uh, Fritz and with your other co-founders like healthy? Because it's really great that you guys met and you connected to each other but you kept that very, very healthy partnership to host so many companies. Not only being serial entrepreneurs, but serial entrepreneurs with that consistent team. Mm. So what advice or replicable things can others apply from what you did? I think one of the things that we, we did was uh, when they actually wanted to help with placement, mm -hmm. we'd actually call a few friends and say, you know, the, this, this engineer is really good, so can you actually hire him? Or this business development girl is really good, so you know, can you give him a position? Um, so we actually helped out with uh, placements for some of our staff. Uh, whenever they had issues with what they were doing, they would actually sort of either ping us off and drop us the email or call us and say, you know, I'm having this issue, can you, uh, what do you think I should do? Or uh, if they were business development and say, no, oh, I need to speak to the other person, can you provide an introduction and, you know, it's no skin off our nose, so we'll actually do that. Uh, so bits and pieces uh, along the way where we've, we decided that it's not going to hurt us by doing the introduction, so what, we might as well try and help the, the employees. Um, and I guess they were, they are very grateful for that. Yeah. And more internally, what uh, what were the rules of communication and relationship between you and Fritz mainly that you guys were very the the very two ones driving most of the ideas and businesses. So how did you keep a healthy relationship between the both of you, <coughs> besides the beer and all the crazy stuff? <laughs> Uh, I guess, hmm, how do we keep the, uh, the relationship healthy? I guess we, we both have mutual respect for each other's capabilities. Again, uh, the great thing about the partnership that we had, we, we always had three partners in, in the, each of the ventures that we went in. Um, and because I'm in advertising, so I get chuck the sales and marketing and business development functions. Uh, Fritz came from corporate world, so he did corporate, uh, corporate business dev and finance. And then we, both of us cannot code for the life, so uh, we always had to rely on a, a third uh, CT, uh, uh, partner that was good in technical. Um, and it, I think that if you're doing a startup, you probably need to look at uh, who you would come take on as co-founders and obviously you know, it's good to actually have someone that has complementary skills rather than the same set of skills because if you have the same set of skills then I think it's kind of wasted. Uh, so I think the benefit that we had was that we, we all both, we all three came from uh, different backgrounds and um, uh, it also uh, we shared an apartment in Beijing, Fritz and I. So, you know, uh, work was uh, at office and at home as well. Uh, so we were fairly close. Um, 
after our friends. So you guys really know each other like really well. Um, and how, how do you define really well? <laughs> <laughs> we had separate bedrooms. <laughs> we had uh, separate, are, different girlfriends. <laughs> you are the one being interviewed here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 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 okay. um, so, I want to ask just a question of more of us having this time for tonight. Besides timing, and definitely, I think the team that we were able to build was really fundamental by the story you're telling for the success of the company. And uh, why do you think that Chunar won the market, whereas the other nine did not? Yeah, we, we were so were wondering about that as well. Uh, because, no, seriously, because. Um, the, the, in the same month that we launched, uh, there were two other companies that launched Meta Search Engine as well, and they were from the travel industry. So we looked at them and said, shit, these guys already know the market, they already know the players, they know the technical jargons to sort of bat around during conferences. Um, so we said, mm, we might be screwed in this one. But we obviously have the internet experience, the internet sub experience, and, and by the time we already had a fairly good network of uh, people that we can actually rely on. Uh, obviously a good team to sort of rely on as well. Um, so based on the experience, we executed better, we executed faster um, than our competitors. And our competitors, I, I think they were sort of too stuck on the business itself rather than on the technology itself. So uh, I think that's what helped us win the, that small battle that we had at the time. Um, we, we the, again, the, the three of us, the founders, we are not from travel, we are internet guys. So we made a very conscious effort during the first year to attend every single travel conference there was from uh, USA to China to the rest of uh, Asia. Because one, we wanted to learn as quickly as possible. Two, we wanted to network with the right people as quickly as possible. And from that, we also managed to actually get a lot of key staff uh, uh, to come to work for us because uh, we needed a biz, biz, biz dev team for um, flights and then we needed a biz dev team for hotels. And uh, when you talk to hoteliers, it's a different language than you talk to the guys from airlines. Um, so through those uh, conferences, we eventually network to the right partners. And I think more importantly, not just the right partners, but to actually get uh, the right staff to actually uh, come on board as well. Mm -hmm. So in essence, it's about execution. Just execute it faster, learn about the industry. And having, I think, do you, what's the way of having a cohesive team in that whole equation? Um, I guess having everyone know that that's the end goal is to be able to build the best uh, meta search uh, engine in China um, and to try and sort of beat our competitors at a time. Um, and once you actually set that goal and everyone's moving towards that goal, then you find that the company as one massive unit moving to the goal is actually very phenomenal. Because mm -hmm. yeah. I, I understand that you basically like have tons of heads that are very capable and already know each other, working towards the same goal. And that, uh, I think that's very hard to replicate though by a startup that's starting now. Because you had a story of since the 2000, since 96? 98. Since 98 to 2004? Five? Five. Five, that team was being built. And um, if you could identify today a company that you would start, what company would that be? I won't start any. <laughs> don't I'm, be I'm, people. I, I don't know. <laughs> For you young people out there, please go out and start a company. I've got an angel, angel fund that I will actually try and look at companies. No, it's, it's just that, um, obviously, I, I'm of an old, older, older generation and I look at the young people these days and uh, this, just this week, this, this week I'm being in KL, um, just to meet up with people and I think by the, the fourth or fifth meeting of the day, I'm like, oh, I'm like, how do these guys do it? They have so much energy and I'm trying to keep up and there's no way I'll actually start another... Excuses. Not excuses, there's no way I'm going to start another <laughs> internet company. Okay, so... What? And again, I, uh, I get asked this a lot of times. Um, 
I, I think if, if I were to go back to China and start up another, if for some strange reason I get kidnapped and go back to China, um, I think it would be extremely difficult for even a person like me who kind of knows uh, China a bit uh, to actually start another company there because there are a lot of returning mainland Chinese from the US, uh, Harvard grads, Stan Stanford grads, and they have obviously the alumni to uh, fall back on. They speak great English, uh, they know what's happening in Silicon Valley, they come back, they execute well. It's really tough to actually operate a, a startup now in China. In China, yeah. but not here. I don't know. <laughs> is, it, is it hard? You should ask them. It's not, I'm not starting up one. <laughs> so, what opportunities do you find now in the market? If you identify uh, such as the, when you started China and you looked at insurance, health, and other industries and you started going for travel, if you look at the market now, the way it is in Malaysia, Southeast Asia, what do you think are the opportunities untapped where we could start or there are gaps where companies do not start yet? So, um, the, again, I so go back to age uh, for a bit. Um, I, I look at the internet now as two separate spheres. Okay? One is the Uberization of things, and then one is the Tinderization of things. Uh, the Uberization of things, I understand. I get it because that's where you are starting a company that's going to make the process efficient. I totally get that. So you, when you want to look at uh, valuing the company or figure out where the revenue streams are going to be or figure out what kind of revenue streams are going to be, it's a lot easier. You come to me and tell me that you're going to do a Tinder for travel, then I will say, mm, uh, I really don't know because it's, it's something that it's so faddish that unless you are able to you know, gain momentum you know, virally or through uh, a, a network, it's going to be hard for me to sort of try and evaluate uh, those kind of things. So when I, when I do my angel investment, I also look at things in that way. Uh, I have invested in the tinderization of things as well, but uh, that's just a, a punt and I say, you know, let's, let's put some money behind it and see what, what happens with that. Uh, but I'm, I'm more towards the uh, Uberization of things, so if you've got an Uber idea, you know, come and see me afterwards. And what industries would you apply Uber to? In any, anything, any, again, uh, I guess going back to your point about how, how do I look at uh, what to start up with, it's, it's anything that you see that's uh, inefficiency in, the, in that process or in that market. If there is such a thing, then there is an opportunity for you to be able to uh, develop something for that market. <laughs> There are too many opportunities then. Yeah. <laughs> Heaps. Yes. Yeah. And uh, that's amazing. So I have my last question and before I give it to the crowd so you guys can start thinking about anything you want to ask. But uh, who are you? Actually I'm that monkey. <laughs> <laughs> but if you would define yourself uh, beyond the title, uh, what defines you? What defines me? Yeah. Uh, okay, so I'm... I'm Currently, it's, it's kind of hard to say because obviously I'm, I'm going through some personal issues. Um, Do you want to talk about it? Huh? <laughs> Do you want to talk about it? Do you have a bed that I can lie on? <laughs> um, so I'm sort of trying to reframe, reframe my life, but uh, at, at, at this point in time, um, it's, it's about living life. Uh, it's about not taking yourself too seriously. Uh, I'm just a small town boy from Shramban. Uh, and I make no qualms about that. Um, I like sort of living life on the edge a bit now. Uh, and yeah, so take things one at a day, one, uh, one, one thing at a time. And if you define something that always has guided your decision making when you had to sell it to Baidu or not sell it to Baidu or you had to partner with someone or not partner with someone or you had to marry someone or not marry someone or travel somewhere or not, what, is the, what are the things that go through your mind when you're making a decision? To marry one, that was easy. Just close and pick. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no, um, what goes through my mind? Um, I guess like, like all sort of business people, you weigh the pros and cons, you um, speak to people, you try and validate your idea. Uh, actually, sort of not much. I think the same process that everyone goes through when they make decisions. 
Uh, obviously, certain decisions you have to ponder a bit longer, but um, again, what I sort of always relied on is uh, gut feel, and it's something that's kind of hard to explain or uh, teach. But uh, I think most of our experience, uh, at least my decisions, have been made on gut feel. But mostly, what inspired you to start companies and then take other risks that would involve instead of just keeping the path safe? Is it the motivation of like making shitloads of money? Is it the motivation of trying out everything? Like, what are the main drivers that brought you to become an entrepreneur? I guess the, the sense of, of you know. Uh, freedom and control, uh, whereas uh, if you were to work for someone all your life, then you be, be basically be a slave to the company or your boss. Uh, I always wanted to be uh, a bit free, um, experiment with new things, um, and always, I guess, with, with the ultimate goal of always saying that if, if, I have, if I can have fun and I make some money out of that, I'm happy. Awesome. Mm. Wow. Thank you very much. Just for now, a round of applause for Douglas, please. And now, I'm giving it up to the crowd. I hope you guys have some good questions. I didn't ask anything about Baidu, so you guys can ask it. That's the easy ones to ask. So, questions from the crowd? There you go. Yes. Um, because I'm Chinese, so I saw that you know China pretty well. But I was surprised how much, what kind of services uh, China is using. So, can I say China is a trip advisor in China? Uh, yes, uh, so when we first started out, we were uh, very focused and said we, we're going to be a meta search engine and we're going to focus on uh, flights and hotels. Uh, that was 10 years ago. Uh, and along the way, Again, this is based on either R&D or based on consumer input. Uh, we've added a lot of other functions uh, onto the website. Um, can you see whether we're a trip advisor? I guess we're a combination of a trip advisor, uh, slash kayak, slash um, travelocity. Uh, yeah, because obviously there's reviews as well in, on the web website. So um, it's, it's become a point where uh, it's... it's we we trying to at least cover as much of the travel requirements as possible. <coughs> um, we also do even for the some of the small airlines, uh, we actually do uh, pricing for them as well. So yield management, uh, which is something that most other websites don't do. So uh, we, a, as the market evolves, as the consumer evolves, we obviously need to evolve as well. And that's why uh, when I tell people that we've got 13,000 employees, everyone says, ah, 13,000 employees. Yeah, I also go, ah, as well, because uh, 13,000 employees is a lot. Uh, you know, you walk into your office and you don't know anyone. Um, but you know, uh, so 60% of that are engineers and they're constantly looking at new things or new ways to be able to deliver the experience to the user. So yeah, I guess we're a mixed mash of, but I, we're a travel website. The largest travel website in China. If I may have another one. Hold on. Um, because nowadays, I was used to work in Yoku. Mm. Um, so Yoku? Yeah, Yoku. Okay. So uh, nowadays, I talk to my colleagues in Beijing. Um, what they talk about is now, there's one in uh, yeah, yeah. China. So it's like this kind of uh, site is going down very badly. Uh, that's why there's a lot of verticals, which like online video you have in Yuku, and then in travel you have China. Um, but in, within traveling, you have hotel based, yep. it's more vertical based now. Yep. So, how do you see China in the future? Where it goes? I think it'll be, again, a point of uh, evolution where um, if, you, if you look at the internet, whether it's in the US or in China, first start off with portals, then portals were, okay, not in flavor, so we actually went into verticals. Uh, verticals now are not in flavor, then we go micro verticals. Um, I, I think with China, after 10 years, I think we're at a point where we are looked at as uh, the Soho uh, Sina or, or net is off travel because we've started 10 years ago we're now doing a lot of stuff there are a lot of competitors that are just doing you know vertical stuff which we have to compete with but uh, I guess thankfully with the R&D development that we have 
uh, sort of con constantly looking at what the, what the consumers want uh, and hopefully being able to provide that, that we may hopefully not lose touch with, uh, with what's happening to them. Yeah. Uh, Charles is a very good friend of mine. Yes. Awesome. Hi, Darius. Hi. It's Jake here. I got a rather personal question to ask. Oh, okay. <laughs> should, we, should we step, step aside? <laughs> oh, it's a known fact that those uh, people who are in this startups and entrepreneurship are very, shall I say, messy, personal lives. You know? <laughs> Many of them went through divorces, hardship, bankruptcy. Mm. Uh, my first question is, uh, I have two questions based on this. First question is, uh, what do you think, what's your view on this point? And second question is, do you have an approach or method to actually you know, separate your personal life and your business so that you can keep preserving it? Uh, that's actually an interesting question because I, I don't know that many founders that have a very messy life, <laughs> personal life. Because uh, I'm now trying to scramble and see which of my friends have, you know, had cocaine and uh, divorced. Like, well, that's kind of hard. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess for me, it's, it's uh, when, when my wife was still around, she was uh, very supportive. Um, she knew that I always wanted to be, you know, in, in, in the startup industry or start, uh, startup uh, side. Uh, she was extremely supportive, and, and at one time where uh, I was not, obviously not working, focusing on the on the business, uh, she was uh, working at the time. Uh, she would sort of say, "Yeah, do whatever you need to do." And at that time, I actually moved to Hong Kong. She refused to move back to Beijing, um, so I had to commute every two weeks, three weeks uh, up in Beijing. And she said, if you have to do it and it makes you happy, go ahead and do it. So she was very supportive. Um, I think what is important is that you don't sort of bring whatever you have at work back home to sort of ruin that. Um, these days it's a lot easier because uh, I'm a widower, so I don't have that issue. Uh, hi, Lewis. Yeah. Yeah, I have uh, two questions for you. Uh, it's about what is your vision for the next five years uh, advertising startup industry in ASEAN? Advertising? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, is there a particular... Is, is there a particular uh, category within advertising? It's like... Uh, digital marketing. Digital marketing? Um, I, yeah, I think in, over the next five years, digital marketing will still We'll, we'll still continue to try. Um, I had a digital agency in Hong Kong for about five or six years, uh, and at the time it was obviously just focused on uh, display advertising, uh, and obviously that's now moved on to uh, social uh, media. I think advertising will still have a role to play uh, in generating revenue, revenues for internet companies, uh, but again, my personal uh, view on that, even though I've come from advertising, is with startups, advertising should be a component of your revenue, but not <coughs> the be all and all of everything. So you do either in-app uh, subscriptions or you know, other revenue streams. So over the next five years in, in Asia, I think there's still opportunities out there. Uh, I sort of don't know specifically which category you're looking at, but uh, there's still opportunities. Okay. Are you going to start up an agency? No. No, okay. <laughs> Okay, another question is about the what is your view toward the start for agriculture? Oh, I don't know that. <laughs> I really don't know. Um, if, if if you think there's an efficient inefficiency in that industry, then there's an opportunity. Um, one startup that I uh, came to pitch me uh, a while back uh, was in construction. And again, I don't know anything about construction, but he basically said that he wants to do a platform or marketplace for uh, eco-friendly products uh, where he would go verify the products and then list them on and then have the contra contractors uh, be able to, I guess, search through and then pick and then give, give out an RFP to the to various suppliers and then have them bid for those. 
Um, so yeah, if, you, if you're looking along that line, then yeah, I think there's always opportunities in whichever industry you're looking at. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Douglas, hi. Yeah. Uh, my name is Gali. I'm uh, with a startup called Zobosh, uh, but I don't want to talk a bit about me. I think for the sake of everyone here, perhaps, uh, how can we be in touch with you if you want to come to you to pitch? Uh, I guess LinkedIn. LinkedIn, which right. after this would be, uh, uh, I will have a lot of requests. I think so, yeah. so it's going to be a bit. Oh, yeah. I've, I've got, yeah, I'll pass out business cards after this. Yeah. They're very simple business cards. Very good. Yeah. Uh, okay, so, all right, I think that's all. Okay. LinkedIn yeah. would be yeah. good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for not pitching. <laughs> <laughs> Hi there. Hi. Um, hi, Douglas. Uh, yeah. yeah, so Thank you. Um, my name is Alan. So, quick one. Of course, building a team, hiring talents, definitely is essential when you're starting up. And, and it's especially hard for you when you, uh, as an expat in China, when you start hiring and stuff like that. So, <coughs> how? What's your best approach in hiring, attracting talents? And second question is. What is that one thing you look into when it comes to your ventures? Thank you. Um, I, I think when you actually go out and hire talent, uh, I guess the process in which you actually get the talent is, is a, a secondary question, but when you actually sort out and say, this is the person I want to, to meet, try not to oversell what you're trying to do. I think more, more often than not, a lot of uh, startups that I see, they say, well, we're going to be the next, da -da -da, and you know, we're going to be millionaires, and you know, we're going to be uh, cruising and drinking crystal champagne. Um, so try not to oversell your promise, but uh, try and make it an inclusive process as well, because again, I think one of the benefits that I had, or we had, was that we included our senior staff in whatever decision-making process we had, because we, we want, it was our company as much as theirs, or their company as much as ours. Um, so making that sort of as, a, as like a family uh, situation would obviously help and go a long way. Hi, uh, my name is Jimmy. Uh, I want to ask about culture. Can you talk a bit about the culture in China? How do you build it? And did you do anything specific to maintain it as a company? 10 people or whatever, to 30,000. Yes. I guess with, uh, with, with China, it was slightly different where uh, the senior management that we brought in, the, the, I think the five or six of them that came in, already knew what we wanted to do or how we actually ran companies. Um, and we sort of relied on them to then bring in their sort of followers um, with obviously the intention that Telling them that this is the direction the company is going to go to. Uh, so we have to actually rely on this, the second tier because I think very quickly we went from 10 staff to 100 staff uh, very shortly. Uh, because at the time, again, because we've, we've already sold a couple of companies, um, we, the startup fund that we, the three of us put in was only slightly bigger, so we actually could uh, go out and hire uh, a lot more people very quickly. Um, so we actually had to then rely on that second level of people to sort of carry down the vision that we actually wanted for the company. Okay, just building on that question before I give it back to them. Was, the culture, uh, was there a cultural shock between Baidu and the company when it was acquired? No, no, nothing at all. Uh, Baidu was very good where, uh, when, they, when they had the majority acquisition, they actually left us alone to do what we want to do. We, we, we initially thought that there was going to be a merger of some sort, uh, but basically they said, you know, go ahead and run the company the way you've run it. Uh, we will make uh, our resources available to you and your team. Um, and they were still at arm's length uh, even when we went IPO. And just curiously, who approached who before? Did you guys show yourself like, oh, we're on sale? We're, 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 uh, <laughs> We're sluts. We're, we, uh, and I'm not afraid to say this. We're sluts. So uh, during that process, we basically went. Oh, okay. Um, the one thing that we, because we are very practical and, and pragmatic about our approach to startups, where we said this is going to be a flip in five years' time. 
uh, I think within the third or fourth month, we made a trip to Silicon Valley. One, to uh, see uh, VCs over that side. Uh, two was actually to uh, visit Googleplex. And Google, Google uh, actually hosted us for a day. We met up with the business development team, we met up with the technical team. And when we met up with the business development team, we said, look, we're starting up this uh, meta search engine in China. Uh, you guys may not sort of have something in plan now, but if you do decide that China is going to be a market for you to go to, you know, we're here. And um, so we actually wanted to sell to Google, but obviously they didn't, they're a bit thick, so they didn't take the hit. Uh, but from, even from that early on, we, we already had looked at all the potential partners that we could sell to. We actually went up there to them and said, look, we're doing this. We, we, we have no, but it's something for us to hide away and say, no, we, we can't tell all these big boys because they might come in and, and uh, rain on our parade. But uh, we said, if they wanted to come in, there's a good opportunity for them to actually acquire us or partner with us and then we're done with it. Um, so when we were also looking at um, the sale of the company, we basically also spoke to as many people as possible, the ones that we wanted to sell to. So we spoke to Expedia, uh, Travelocity, uh, Trip, Baidu, Tencent, and basically would, would uh, it's like the beautiful mind, right? You sort of try and play the one off the other. Um, and there would be meetings where I would go and Fritz won't be around and I say, oh, sorry, Fritz has to do an, an, attend another meeting with Expedia. Uh, but yeah, let's, never mind. Let's, let's continue to talk for a while. Um, and so then, we, we obviously got burnt a few times where they said, okay, fine, go and talk to them, don't talk to us. Um, but it sort of, I guess, worked to our advantage. Interesting. Mm. And you mentioned over a random conversation we had something about you guys being similar to Rocket Internet or what they did, the German brothers. Uh, yeah, not really, but because we only have four ventures and they have like, I don't know, 40 ventures. Um, yeah, some, something. Yeah, 400, yeah. No, we just, we're opportunities. So basically, we looked at the US and see what's happening in the US and said, let's replicate, replicate that in China. In that sense. Yes. Nice. More questions for the floor. Hi Douglas. Hi. Hi yeah. um, I want to ask you, in the beginning, when you were sort of trying out, uh, when you were going to build uh, Shaway, right? were you working with your previous company at the same time, or did you just do a clean cut and move over? No. Uh, what was that transition like? Uh, there was no transition actually. Uh, so that the first venture I was still with uh, at that time was uh, JWT Mindshare. Uh, and when I started the company, I actually went up to WPP and said, look, uh, I'm going to start this internet company. Uh, is it okay with you guys? And, you know, because it was such a new thing, they said, yeah, fine, go ahead and do it. Um, you know, we might even put some money behind you. Um, so I kept my day job. Um, and so Fritz basically ran the company uh, throughout the time. Then after that, I sort of, uh, with Shina, I was more of a full-time job. Okay, we're going to ask our last question, unless someone is very desperate, but last question. Yeah, that's, I'm going to jog your memory a bit. Uh, okay. Because being so big, Gina, all right, um, from day one till, till you were so big, all right? Okay. Um, <laughs> what are the that's, that's, what, what, that's what the women say. Uh, <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> Um, so, what was three most important learnings that you had uh, in dealing with merchants? Because I believe you would have dealt with so many merchants mm. um, in so many different industries. Um, so, what do they really want and what are your three most important learnings? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I think with, with anything new, we always had a lot of pushback. So with uh, with the meta search, uh, first meta search in China, when you spoke to the hoteliers or the airlines, they said, "No, well, why do we, why do we need to work with you? Because we already work with the OTAs, uh, we're, and we're now starting to sell directly to consumers with uh, best price uh, policies on their website." Um, and we had to just continue to educate and educate and educate. 
uh, till they actually saw the reason why they should actually work with us. We were also fortunate in that we had two very big partners fairly immediately. One was IHG and one was uh, Hilton Hotel because they were already working in the US with Kayak and when we actually met them in Asia, they said, yeah, fine, I know what, you want, what, what you're doing, so it's easier. Um, and later on, I found out that the guy at IHG went on to also do, was also doing, planning to do a matter search engine. It's now called WeGo in Singapore. Oh. Yeah, so he was very sly of him. Uh, because yeah, you know, throughout the whole meeting, he used to ask me questions about, hey, wow, this guy knows a lot about you know, scraping and you know, technical stuff. Like, um, Three key learnings. Mm. I guess with China, it was more of perseverance. Um, even, even in spite of the fact that we kind of know how to do a startup, um, every startup that we do is a, obviously in a new industry. Um, and we said, let's not be, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Not, let's not think that because we've done a few exits that we're super rock stars and um, you know, be hubris about things. So, um, just persevere with, with uh, what you need to do and want to do and where you want to get yourself to. I, the other two, I, I don't know whether there's any other two, but I think that would be key. Persevere means having a thick face. Yeah. Having yes. a thick face and yeah. going back to the merchant again. And again, 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 yeah. Uh, in, my, in the first startup with Xiaowei, uh, we, we, in, try, in trying to get revenue, uh, that time, Fritz would actually go and play tennis with the IBM client and sort of lose to the client. <laughs> I, 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 I would actually play mahjong with the Motorola client and also lose to the client. <laughs> so you sort of, yeah, I guess when, you, when you're desperate, you want to do things that, okay, within the realm of uh, legal stuff, right? So you have to do things that you need to do. And I get the other thing, so coming back, uh, a point that reminds me, I, I think these days there's startups get too much money, uh, receive too much money, and, and when you receive too much money, it's just so easy to buy stuff, buy you know, human resource, buy expertise, uh, buy uh, partnerships. Uh, I think the, the, the startups that are very lean and have their back against the wall, those are the ones that are very creative. Um, and so if you're raising money, don't raise too much. So that would probably be one of your advice to the, to the young chiku today. Uh, oh. That would be something that we... Yeah, because my, my check size is very small. <laughs> that would be something that we really need to learn. Yeah. I think it's, these days it's just too easy to get away with you know, just throwing money against a problem. Also, any last question? Okay. <coughs> nice read the last one. <laughs> We're not going to bring him again, he's so so so. <laughs> not to say that, I want to bring the last word. But, uh, how do you know when to call it quits? I mean, from the founder perspective as well as from the investor perspective. <coughs> from the investor perspective, it's very, very easy. I think you look at the business and you kind of know whether the, the company is going to survive or not. Uh, and if the matrix aren't there, whether it's you know user growth, uh, revenue growth, um, whatever matrix that you're following isn't there, then you, you have to sort of call it quits. But the onus is on you as well as in, being an investor is to make sure that you've done your part in trying to make sure that the company survives, whether it's through um, providing um, access to your network, uh, providing uh, introductions to business partners, uh, helping out with you know, uh, different revenue streams or ideas. And things. As a, uh, the owner of the company, uh, again, I think that you have to see the signs on the wall to see if, is it the right time to exit? Uh, do you have um, people who are willing to buy your company or invest in your company? Uh, I, I think that it's kind of hard to again pinpoint when is the right time. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just hard to pinpoint. I mean, in the sense that you want to, you know there's value in the company you speak and sell. Yeah. But if you're hitting brick walls, for example, like let's say you were talking about your second company where you're doing the ladies, ladies, starting ladies, you call it quits after 12 months. But that was because you saw the numbers. Was that, but you were founder as well. 
So was it a, uh, a collective decision by all of partners? Or? Yeah, it was. It was collective decision, and we we I remember that night very vividly because uh, we sat down. We said, look, this is not going anywhere. With I think that venture was a few hundred thousand dollars. We said this isn't any going anywhere any quickly because the users just aren't there. We we're getting like twenty thousand users a month. That's not going to jump up overnight, not even in the next twelve months. So that was kind of easy to sort of pull the plug on. Um, let's say like you know pulling the plug on whether we, should we take uh, Baidu's money versus uh, ten cents money. Um, Again, we looked at it also from a strategic point of view and said, Baidu is a search engine, so we could actually benefit from their, their technology as well and their people. Um, and obviously, they had a big name. Tencent had a big name as well, but Tencent was uh, a bit stingy, and that's why they call Tencent. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, they, yeah. Um, so they, uh, they, they weren't very uh, generous with their valuation, and we said, yeah, let's, let's go with the more strategic uh, money. And again, it, I guess it, well, the time to sell the company is uh, is when you don't want to be too greedy. You know, if you say you've made enough, you've, you're happy with the with the amount of money that you'll get from from the venture, then so be it. Thanks. You don't want to be too greedy. No. Nope. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> For being here, you're welcome.